following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Ion Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hance. Very happy to be joined by Tony Palmieri uh, because we're going to be interviewing candidates for the upcoming 2015 spring election. Um, tonight, we're going to be interviewing one of the candidates for the Oshkosh School Board and one of the candidates for the Oshkosh Common Council. And it's kind of a strange election. <laughs> There's basically no contested race here. Uh, there were four candidates for the Oshkosh School Board um, and about two weeks ago one of the candidates dropped out. However, she didn't drop out in enough time to get her name off the ballot so it will still be on the ballot and so we're still proceeding with interviewing all those other school board candidates and uh, the other two remaining candidates will be on in a future show. And because we had an extra slot to fill then, um, we were um, graciously um, um, given an opportunity to talk to one of the people running for the Oshkosh Common Council. And he's a newcomer, so we'll talk to him for half an hour later in this hour. So um, tonight we're going to be talking to Jim Evans, and he's one of the new people who's going to be seated on the school board. And that's a given because... <laughs> Well, I guess Strange it could. Strange things can I happen. I guess it, it could. It could. <laughs> it, yep. Um, the person who who dropped out is um, Uma Malik, and um, but like I said, her name is still on the ballot. So just keep that in mind when you go to the polls um, next month. So welcome, Jim. Thank I'm you. very happy that Thank you're you here, for and me. Uh, Tony is uh, happy you're here as well. So <laughs> and I'm happy you're both here. So why don't we uh, start out by telling us a little bit about yourself and you know what your background okay. is and why you're throwing your hat in this crazy political race? Well, I'm an Oshkosh native. I'm from Oshkosh, um, and. Actually, the reason I'm here in town is because of the school system. Um, my sister lost her hearing at a very early age, and my father is teaching in Kimberly. And Oshkosh had a, a superior school for the deaf. So he applied for a job here, got a job at South Park, moved here, and one year later I, I was born. So I'm here because of the school system. Um, as my father is a teacher. <laughs> Started out of South Park, then went to the high school, and when they built the new North High, he moved over to the North, he taught art at North. My mother is also a teacher where she taught at Reed and Lincoln for most of her career. Um, I did not go into education. I went into business. I own the art house downtown. So I'm a small business owner. But I think that gives me a good background because I come from an education family, plus I'm a business owner. So I can kind of see both both sides of that. Sure. Um, I guess I got him first started getting involved when they were building Oak Lawn. I was asked to do a testimonial on on TV, and since I don't like to be on TV, that was a, that was a hard thing for me to do. And here you said. I know <laughs> the sacrifices we make, um, but I did a little testimony on that how I thought it should be built, um, and then. I got involved with the referendum that we just had, um, and this just seemed like the next logical step is to actually, you know, I 
as you say, I complained enough, I, I criticized enough, now I should do something about it. Sure, so. sure. Um, you said you got involved, really heavily involved, uh, when Oaklawn was, was being proposed and so forth. Um, was it built to your liking? Yeah, I think okay. they did a good job with uh, energy five-star rating, I think is what they call it. And that's, uh, okay. Was there something that you had wanted to see that is not there? No. Um, I really, the, for the Oak Lawn, I just made the testimony on, on for their media coverage. Then I got involved, really involved, with the last referendum we had. Okay. So that's when I really got, I, I served on the Budget Resolution Committee. Okay. On that All right. Sand Mac put together. Oh boy, will we have some questions for you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, what do you feel? I mean, you said you're a business owner and, and your folks were teachers, so you can kind of see both sides. Do you feel that there are other assets that you bring to the board? Um, I bring um, a business sense to it. I've, you know, when you own your own business, uh, you have to make do with what you have in the till. And there are some things that you would certainly love to buy, stock or uh, anything, but you just can't do it, so you got to find other ways of doing it. So I think that's, that's a valuable lesson, um, working within the budget okay. of, of a small business is, right. is incredibly difficult. Um, I know Tony's got some questions sure. too, but I, I did want to just throw one thing out there. Um, now, I recently read a comment posted on the Northwestern site, and... I'm, I'm somewhat known there on that site. This particular poster called you a yes man and a, quote, buddy of the district, unquote. I know people can sometimes make really strange comments that you have no idea where they're coming from, and I don't know what this gentleman's perspective was, but it is out there, and people are reading it, so I wanted to at least give you an opportunity to respond to it. I mean, do you have any connections or ties to the district, and do you intend to be a rubber stamper on the board? The uh, only ties I had to the district is where my parents taught, and they're both retired, and my father is, is deceased. Um, so I don't have any other ties to the school board that way. Um, Northwestern comments can be pretty far out. Mm -hmm. um, I made them make comments that far out. Other people make them all about me. Um, I don't know how I can be a yes man without ever having served on, on a board before. Um, Could he possibly have been getting some of this from your service on the, on the budget committee? Um, on the budget committee, that was mainly making recommendations for cuts. And I think if I was a yes man, I wouldn't be making recommendations for cutting. Okay. I would be making recommendations to, you know, you got to get this money one way or the other. Sure. Well, thank you for, you know, for clarifying that. I did want to give you a chance because, like I said, it's out there. So. Yeah, there'll be Jim, is there, uh, is, is there one issue that you're passionate about that you think the board should move forward on over the next three years? I am passionate about STEAM. Now, everybody knows STEM, science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and math. And I want to bring the A, the arts, into it uh -huh. um, to make it STEAM. Um, studies have shown that if you bring art into the learning process, they retain it longer, grades are higher. Um, and it's, it's, when I was writing down my, my on a questionnaire, I had to fill out, you know, three things you want to do. I was coming up with three things, and that's making STEM into STEAM was my last one. And then all of a sudden I moved it up, and now it's my first one. That's what I want to yeah. do the most. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly on the importance of the arts. But as you know, in tough budget times, which we seem to always be in, it becomes more difficult to advocate for the arts. So given that the governor's budget is not going to be very kind to the school districts again, and we don't know if anything will be cut. Hopefully we won't have to cut anything in the Oshkosh School District. But how do you envision being able to make a case for more arts in this budget environment? I think the arts are, and again, I own an art supply store. Right. My father's an art teacher. There's no hiding that I'm, I'm an art person. But I think, I think the arts have saved more people and made them graduate from high school than 
any math or English or science class. I've, when my father passed away, the students mm -hmm. wrote letters. And there were so many letters that said, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have art class. I would have dropped out. I would not have made it through school. You know, thank you for, for, for being there. Right. And um, How would you I, rate the current condition of the arts in the Oshkosh School District? Is there enough? Is there... It sounds like you want more. Well, I don't think you can ever have enough art. You never have enough, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if, if you had to grade it right now, are we at a C? Are we at a B? Um, it's, it's good. I would say B. Uh, okay. Needs improvement. Okay. Um, it just quantitatively, we just need more. Yeah. All right. So I want to go back to my question. How, how do you plan on the board to advocate for it? Because I could imagine your colleagues on the board and the superintendent saying, agree with you, Jim, great idea, but we just can't go there in this budget environment. Like, what, what's going to be your case well, for, how, for how it isn't that important? As far as STEAM classes... I mean, the research is out there that if you add art into the mix, right. it gets better. I mean, that's what we're after, to get better, better results. And that, mm -hmm. if you see the results, why would you say, well, yeah, we can't, but we can't do that? Well, we ha okay, let's, we have a couple, the report card came out from DPI. I'm sure you've seen some of these numbers. Uh, we have two uh, elementary schools in the district that exceed expectations, right? Um, Traeger. Elementary, the uh, the Oakwood Environmental Charter exceed, but then we've got Jefferson Elementary and Emmeline Cook that meet few expectations right now. Um, do you think that Jefferson and Emmeline is it arts that they're lacking? They're, I don't think they're lacking arts. I think um, the arts would would be a, a way of of improving. Um, and you look at those places, they're both in a lower economic... Well, right. That's, yeah. So do we have a great class discrepancy in the Oshkosh school system? Um, well, there's certainly schools that have and schools that are, are in, in need. Right. And what do you think a school board should do about that? What, what you got to uh, make sure that we can get as many resources with, uh, with what's going on at the state level. Um, right. They're just decimating the, the schools, and mm -hmm. it gives us less and less to, to work with, but you still have to find a way to, to give them the resources they need. Yeah. And it's, it's getting more difficult every, every year when, the, when he makes a new budget. It, it just gets... Just one more in this, Cheryl. Sure, yeah. the, uh, as you know, the governor in Act 10 uh, essentially stripped teachers of meaningful bargaining mm -hmm. rights under the argument that it gave the districts the tools to balance their budgets. You don't believe that, do you? No, I think um, it, was a, it was a ruse. I don't think, because everything that Act 10 did, for the most part, the teachers didn't do anyhow. They're going to pay more for their insurance. They're going to pay more in their pension. Mm -hmm. um, what Act 10 did was it wasn't put in to, to save the budget. Right. The state budget. The state right. budget was going to be fine with or without Act 10. Mm -hmm. the, little, the little things that the other boards did to, to save money in their district was not a drop in a bucket for the state budget. Mm -hmm. If it were up to you, the teachers would have their full bargaining rights restored. I think that would be a good way of working. Yeah. Okay. And you, you, would, you could confidently tell the taxpayers that if that did happen, that that there would not be a substantial cost to taxpayers. I think the taxpayers would know because before Act 10, right. they had the full bargaining, collective bargaining process, and, and they weren't, I know people say that they'd like to say that on mm -hmm. certain websites and stuff, but they right. weren't running amok and they weren't holding you know, the, the school boards hostages over, over you got to give us this amount of money or we're, we're out. I think it was a workable, it was a working solution. And mm -hmm. Okay, Cheryl? Well, uh, keeping with the uh, budget discussion, um, you know, Governor Walker uh, is certainly creating a lot more problems <laughs> for public education uh, recently. In his proposed biennium budget, he's neither adding to the revenue limit nor is he including a per pupil increase. Uh, so for the next two years, anyway, if that budget's approved as he's proposing it, it doesn't matter if the district's insurance costs go up, if their fuel costs go up, no matter what, 
tough luck for the school district and whoever is within the school district. Mm -hmm. They get no more money. So, you know, how are we going to balance a budget? How are we going to pay for the things that we already have, the things that we want, such as more art? Um, you know, how, how are we going to do this when this governor just continues to chisel away at everything that, and, and by the way, public education is constitutionally mandated. So he's taking something that's a constitutional mandate in this state and stripping here, chiseling there, and gutting the, over there. Where are we going to find the money for all this? Well, there's three ways that you, you get money in for schools. One is to raise the per pupil spending. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Other one is through referendum, and we just had one of those, and we're going to have to have some more later on. The third way is to bring more students in to the system, because mm -hmm. every student you bring in, you get that extra money. Right. Recruiting and retention of students is going to be a huge in the up and coming years. It's getting that way now, but it's going to be huge where you're going to, I predict you're going to have actual recruiters being hired by districts to go out and find more students to bring in that more money that they're not getting from the state anymore. Do you have any ideas um, other than maybe hiring someone who's charged with the recruitment, do you have some ideas as to what the district should be doing? You have to make the district appealing. Um, and I think that's starting to go on now. You see some school districts that are, are powerhouses in sports, and mm -hmm. they're going to start getting the, the athletes, Arrowhead, um, Kakana, or Kimberly, okay. mm -hmm. um, things like that. Um, but the problem is that with more cuts coming, the you're going to have to cut more programs, and that's going to make your school district less of a place where people want to go. So it's, it's like a never-ending circle. You cut money, so okay, we've got to cut this up. Right. This student really likes that. So now the students are going to go, well, I'm going to find that somewhere else. I'm going to go to Appleton, go to Nina to get that. And it's, it's going to get, I think it's going to get pretty ugly in the next few years if this keeps up. Yeah. Uh, well, although, I mean, every school district across the state is going to be in the same district as far as public education goes with some of the things that, that Walker is proposing here. When I hear the word referendum, the hair on the back of my neck, Jim, just stands up. It's like nails on a chalkboard since we're talking about education here. I understand that some referendums are absolutely necessary, um, like when you're talking about a new school, for example. Um, to replace something that's old and, and just completely has seen its its last days. But to just keep providing the status quo and putting more referendums on the ballot to do that, I don't think that's right or is it fair to the taxpayer. I mean, at some point, every one of us sitting at this table or the crew in this room, as soon as they start working and, and paying taxes, we can't, where are we supposed to keep getting all this money to pay for referendum after referendum after referendum? Well, last April there was like 60, 68 school referendums on the ballot in April. Mm -hmm. All because of Act 10 and what that took away. Um, if the state's not going to fully fund education like they should, which is, I think, the most important thing the state does, is have public education. It's going to have to be paid for somehow, somewhere. Um, I would much rather have it come from the state where everybody's, you know. Well, that's true, but what are you going to do? Because after a while, I can guarantee the referendums are going to start failing. People simply don't have the money. It's not just the school district demanding more money. It's, it's the city. It's the county. It's the state schools. Mm -hmm. You know, my pay isn't going up as rapidly as, as some of the costs are, you know, people just simply can't afford it. So at such time that a referendum then fails, then what? Then we're going to really start seeing school districts. I would, some of them are probably even going to have to close and merge with other school and districts. And that would be a shame, too. You know, I mean, as a school board member, would you advocate, um, you know, the, the district en masse? I, I mean, I know that this is sort of passe, if you will, because <laughs> the school teachers have a huge and very powerful lobby, but it wasn't enough to, you know, save them from Act 10. Um, but, you know, what if 
school districts in mass, including school board members and school superintendents, you know, lobbied the governor to, hey, you know, you're, you're basically going against the Constitution by continuing to strip money from something that the state is mandating. I mean, wouldn't that perhaps, maybe it's pie in the sky, but wouldn't that perhaps be a better place to start than, you know, oh, Governor Walker's doing this, so we're going to make you, yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Taxpayer, pay for it? Well, I'm, I know that this school district has contact. They just sent off a resolution to Senator Gudix about, you know, saving, you know, do something about this. And, you know, the governor has heard. He's certainly heard from me. Mm -hmm. um, I know he's heard from a lot of other people. Uh, but when they have that set mentality, yeah. um, you know, they, they can hear from, well, they do hear from every state and every citizen in the state, and they still, they still don't listen to what, mm -hmm. what the people are saying. Right. Jim, you're going to be working closely now with uh, Superintendent Stan Mack. Um, can you give us your uh, evaluation of uh, the job you think he's done so far? I think he's doing a super job. Um, when I first decided to, to do this, I did my due diligence and I started going to different right. events. And I don't know when that man eats. He is out every night at some event, you know, it being seen in the community, mm -hmm. uh, being seen in the schools. Um, I think it's unfortunate that we're having him on the towards the end of his career. You know, I think he would have been a, you know, really good person to have in mid career right. and see what he do. But I think he's doing a, a fine job, and I, I hope have in you, my time on the board, I don't have to go through a search. You know? uh, yeah. <laughs> um, have you spoken with him about your uh, your desire to have uh, a greater arts emphasis? Mm -hmm. What has he said? He uh, nodded his head. He said, mm -hmm. yeah. No, again, that's that's a hard thing for me to hide from right. my, my background and what I do for right. a living. So you know, I'm thinking, uh, you know, we're talking about recruiting, that um, arts focus could be a way to brand the school district so that if you've got Kimberly, that maybe is more the athletic focus. I mean, you, you almost hate to say this stuff because people think you're saying we should weaken our sports. No, we've got strong sports. But if we did have a unique brand, I know it's the cliche word now, yeah. That Oshkosh is a place where you go maybe for an arts emphasis. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah, I think. I think, especially I think with the modern-day parents, I think, are more open to that. Yeah, I think schools are going to be looking for what they can offer that's unique. Yeah, that's, and, yeah. Uh, what do we do that other districts don't do? And then, who knows? That could be one of the mm -hmm. angles. That's a good point. Um, in recent years, Jim, we've been hearing about Common Core testing, um, and now... Since we're talking about Walker, mm -hmm. <laughs> Walker's kind of uh, swinging the other direction, and um, he's finally discovered that um, you know there's no mandate for school districts to even use educational standards. Um, but in his budget plan, he wants to get rid of standardized tests that go along with Common Core, and you know he's he's wanting to basically leave it up to the districts to decide what kind of testing they're going to do. What is your feeling on Common Core? What's your feeling on standardized testing? And you know, what do you think the district should do? I think Common Core is is good. Um, it gives you a baseline across the entire country of of what students should know. I think that's a good thing because you could have a school that thinks they're doing really well, but they can't compete with anybody else because they're not learning the right things. Um, having said that. Uh, no, this is where I, I do a U-turn. I'm not a big fan of standardized tests. I don't think it, it, it's an accurate way of, of um, reflecting learning. I happened when I was in school, I was a very poor test taker, but I, I, I knew the stuff. If it was a verbal exchange, I could do it. But once that paper is sent in front of me, I somehow froze, and I was a very poor test taker. Um, I know standardized tests are needed. They need, they're needed in the Common Core. I just read today that there is a school district that is going to have to do 22 more tests before the end of the year of just these standardized tests for measuring. And it's getting to be where, you know, the kids aren't there to learn right. fun, learn, uh, learn of, uh, they're learning 
for the test only. And teaching is now teaching to the test instead of teaching in a creative way of, of learning. Um, so I, I, I certainly don't want to have everything be standardized testing. That's all I do. And I don't think that's a good way of learning at all. Okay. Can I just ask one last Go question? Right ahead, Cheryl, uh, we're almost out want. of time. Sure. Um, and I've been asked to ask this question. Um, so it's not even my question, but I'll put it out there anyway. Um, you know, Oshkosh is becoming a much more diverse community and but it doesn't seem like there's as much diversity in the public sector employment mm -hmm. and I'm wondering since you're going to be on the board of education what is your plan if you will uh, to improve the hiring practices so that there are more people of color people of minority employed within the Oshkosh Area School District? Well, this was brought up at the recent citywide PTO meeting that I attended. Um, and I was told that they are vigorously trying to hire a more diverse staff and faculty. Do you know what they're trying um, to do? How are they doing that? They're, they're trying to, to re, you know, recruit the problem is that our, the main feeder system for Oshkosh is UWO, and UWO itself doesn't have a huge, huge diversity um, mm -hmm. student body. Um, on top of that, student teaching programs all across the country are, are, are losing students. It's, they're down all across the country because of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so not only are you trying to re recruit minorities, but you're trying to re recruit minorities to a field that has lost respect in the public. Yeah. Um, At least you, in this state. Yeah, and, yeah. and you, you, the salary you get is going to be low to start with, mm -hmm. and it's not going to go up that much throughout your time if things stay the same. Yeah. Um, and that's a hard thing to, to, to recruit people into. Yeah. Yep. I mean, throughout my teaching career, I've always taken my best students aside and encouraged them to get into teaching. In the last four or five years, they look at me like I'm from Mars. Yeah, why would I possibly go into teaching? And I think it's because of some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, or they'll go into teaching in some other state where it's not as bad as here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you want to ask another one? No, on no, no, go right ahead. Um, we're down to about two minutes. Okay, what, Jim, what do you see as the role of the school board member in terms of your relationship to your constituents? Do you believe that the school board member should be fielding complaints about, you know, buses not being on time, you know, didn't like the quality of the sub? Or do you think that... Uh, school board member is there to formulate policy to give to the superintendent. What, what, what do you see as your relationship with your constituents? Well, I think, I think hearing about that stuff is just, you know, that's going to happen. Okay. Um, whether that's my job. I think I, my job would be coming in if they don't get immediate satisfaction going up the chain. I don't All think right. I'm the first person you should go to. Okay. Um, I think um, if they don't, if they're not getting satisfaction going through the first couple of people, then then um, they can come to me. Like I said, I own a store. I'm there 9:30 to 6 every day, so I'm kind of a captive audience for people if they want to come in and talk oh, to me. Sure. Um, you know, because yeah. I'm not gonna, I can't just like lock the door and leave. Yeah. So I think it's going to be very easy for people to get a hold of me if they want to yeah. want to talk about something. You yeah. could have an easel set up. And have them, like, <laughs> Draw their problem out. Uh, the dry mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you for being here. Why don't you take about 20, 30 seconds, just look right into camera three and tell people why they should vote for you on Tuesday, April 7th. Um, I'm a local person. Um, I'm a business owner. I'm a supporter of the arts. Um, I'm going to bring that unique perspective to the board I mean a small business owner plus being a, 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 a art guy and um, I think it's uh, it was brought up once that well you don't have any children why why are you running if you don't have any children I said I got a great education through Oshkosh I want to make sure that continues for other people and I think I can do help that along I think I can do a good job with that 
So. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Just sit tight. We're going to take a very short break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Ben Stepanek, candidate for the Oshkosh Common Council. We'll be right back. Thank you very much. All right. Good job. Thank Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. And welcome back to the second half of Ayan Oshkosh. We're joined now, as promised just before the break, by Benjamin Stepanek. He is a candidate for the Oshkosh Common Council. His name will be appearing on the ballot as Benjamin, but he has said we can call him Ben, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so we always start out the candidate interviews, Ben, by um, you know having you tell a little bit about yourself and and you know why you're doing this. <laughs> why are you running? <laughs> Well, uh, I'm a student at UW Oshkosh with a major in political science and a minor in public administration. Um, it's my goal to pursue a master's degree in public administration at some point. Um, but I've had the opportunity, especially over the past couple of months, to speak with many residents of Oshkosh. And um, it didn't matter whether their issue was something the state government or federal government was doing. It all came back to an issue I think we can solve locally and work together. Um, on local issues. So I wanted to get involved. I wanted to help solve these issues. So I, I decided to run for uh, Common Council. Okay. Well, and as we talked about at the outset of this first half, you're pretty much a shoe in unless <laughs> there's someone who mounts the major successful, <laughs> you know, write-in campaign. There's three candidates and, and there's three open seats. So I, I, how old are you, may I ask? Uh, I'm 20. Okay. So I would venture to say that you are probably going to be <laughs> the youngest counselor that we've ever had. I, wouldn't you say so? Yeah. You're, you're going to be the third student ever to serve. Uh, David Crucius was a graduate student mm -hmm. back in the 70s, and Matt O'Malley around the year 2000. Yep. Yep. Matt, I think, was 22 or 21 when he, when he got in. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, th I think you'll probably be the youngest, mm -hmm. uh, but not by, by much probably. Right. What, um, you know, I'm impressed with your background and, and what you're pursuing here as, as a major. Um, what assets would you say you're bringing to the council? Um, I think... I think there's very, definitely something very beneficial to having a younger member on the council and um, someone from the university. Um, I think I can help build that partnership with the university. Um, I, and I think there's a lot um, the university is already doing, but I think having someone on that council to help kind of bridge that university community gap I think is going to be really good for uh, make, making a stronger Oshkosh because of it. Ben, describe the gap for us, what, yeah. what kind of gap exists? Um, I think there's just a general gap between, um, you know, I think students don't necessarily get engaged very much in the community, and mm -hmm. I think we, um, the university can do a better job of engaging community members with the campus. Yeah. Um, 
I really like what the university has done with the Quest 3 program. Um, it's, a, it's a new um, kind of take on general education. Um, I had a civic, um, from being through it personally, I did a civic engagement class. Mm -hmm. um, and what it did was it found a community partner. Um, so our civic engagement class was based around um, domestic violence mm -hmm. um, and policies around that. So our community partner was Christine Ann. So I had the opportunity to see something that, and you know, work at Christine and be a volunteer and be a part of something that, if I hadn't taken that class, I wouldn't have been engaged in that part of the community. Okay. In the in the fall semester, uh, we had somewhat of what I'll call a crime wave um, <laughs> around the campus, right? People getting Absolutely. beaten and robbed. And were you satisfied with the city's response to that, especially the city police? I mean, it's one of the reasons why you're running to make the city more responsive to the safety of the campus area? Well, I think, uh, I think the city did um, respond very well to those incidents. Um, but I think um, there's a lot we can do to improve um, campus community safe safety, and I would like to work with uh, campus police to, to help maintain that safety on campus. Like what, what do you think we can do? Um, lighting, I think, is a big issue on okay. campus. Um, there are several lights that either didn't work or there are just areas that are just too dark and it's not safe for students uh, coming back, especially like those evening classes. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's a necessarily a safe environment. So I think lighting's a, a big step we can take. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask a question about yeah. the, the, uh, the pub crawl? Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> has been uh, very contentious in town. Uh, the city has taken the alleged organizer, because he won't acknowledge that he is the organizer, to, mm -hmm. to court to recruit costs. Um, what do you feel about that event? I mean, do you think it's something that the city should try and prevent from happening? I mean, I live in a neighborhood, for example, that gets treated very poorly on the pub crawl nights. I mean, mm -hmm. so we had to literally start our own, we call it Project Safe Passage, just to guide people through the neighborhood who might otherwise engage in some mischievous <laughs> behavior. I mean, what's, what's your general view of the event? Well, um, I think it's kind of interesting. I'll be the only probably stakeholder in this that can't participate right. <laughs> in pub crawl. But I think um, the most important thing we need to do is we need to bring the stakeholders together. We have this controversy every time pub crawl comes around. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be in communication now with um, bar owners, uh, the organizer. And I think if you ask the bar owners, the organizers, uh, university, and the city, everyone's going to say they want a solution. Um, so we need to be in talks now to find that solution. I think everyone uh, can take a meaningful first step. Um, I think for the city and the bar owners, that, might, that meaningful first step might be sitting down and actually talking about this right. and making sure we don't end up in court. Um, the university, I think, can take policies um, similar to what Eau Claire does during uh, pub, or not pub crawl in Eau Claire, but Oktoberfest, mm -hmm. um, where they prevent guests from coming into the dorms. And I think that would create a safer campus, uh, safer residence halls. Okay. Um, but I think if we can take that meaningful first step together, we're going to build some trust and we can ultimately find a solution. Great. Excellent. Um, well, besides money being probably the toughest <laughs> issue that you're going to face when you're sitting up there on the council dais, and we'll talk about the money. Um, you know, I want to talk about some other things. Um, a recent study showed that there are approximately 100 homeless people in the city of Oshkosh. Now, you know, I, I'm not sure what you would propose to do to help solve that problem um, or at least eliminate it for some. Mm -hmm. We've got a shelter currently. It operates only six months out of the year, and it only has enough space for 25 people. And at that point, you're just out in the cold, literally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and people are finding shelter wherever they can. And sometimes that's not the most, <laughs> <laughs> the nicest of places, mm -hmm. to say the least. So what would you propose? Um, I think the first thing to do to solving this issue, this issue and any issue is bring in the meaningful stakeholders. Let's bring in the shelter. Let's bring in the city. Um, and I guess in this situation, I would like the shelter, I would like to hear their ideas. Um, I'm certainly, I guess, not an expert in saying how we're going to fix the problem. So I would like to hear from them first and hear what their ideas are and how they think the city can help and then uh, move from there. But mm -hmm. I think if we listen to um, the people that are, you know, effectively doing their best, in this area and take advice from them, I think we're going to move in the right direction. But mm -hmm. that would be my first step. Is that an issue that you would spearhead if, if you're, well, I shouldn't say if you're elected, you're <laughs> elected. Um, you know, is that something that you would spearhead? 
Absolutely. Um, homelessness is, I mean, we have to address it. It's, it's mm -hmm. unacceptable in our city that we have this many people that have no shelter. Um, well, so I would, I would spearhead that issue. Um, I would start with the shelters, and I, I really hope to tackle this issue and bring some meaningful change to it. Well, they've got a new executive director over there that, right. as of this taping, is um, this is only her second week on the job. So, um, you know, she's probably ripe for the picking. So <laughs> go get her. Um, so the Marion Road water tower. You, you're mm -hmm. smiling. You knew that was coming. <laughs> That is being proposed to be taken down and something new erected. And, you know, I don't know. I don't understand the reasons behind why they feel that this needs to be done. And clearly, I don't think a lot of citizens understand it either. They're saying, why can't, you know, if it's some kind of a blemish on the face of the city, just repaint it. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to totally tear something down. And especially in these very, very difficult economic times. Mm -hmm. Do you understand the reasons behind why it has to be basically raised and something new put up? Mm -hmm. um, well, when I read the report about the Marion Water Tower, um, basically, the report basically said that it, it needed to be changed, or we need to build a new one, um, that eventually it wouldn't be able to, I believe it was like pump at the same capacity, and eventually it would, um, it would affect how, uh, how much water we're going to have for you know, public safety or fire and um, for our fire department and issues like that. Um, so, I think, so I think we do have to change it. We have to maintain public safety. We have to give our firefighters the best opportunity uh, to put out those fires. So um, the report did say that it could, the water tower could maybe have its lifespan up to 20 more years, um, but the city has budgeted for the project. Um, the city has budgeted four hundred four hundred thousand dollars to the project, um, and the project's estimated cost is two hundred thousand dollars. So I think we should move forward with the project. Um, the report said that you know a new water tower could last us another eighty to one hundred years, and we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what ten years will bring. And I think if we can provide uh, a need for the next eighty to one hundred years today, then we need to go ahead and fill tomorrow's need today. Okay. Now I'm going to take issue with that. All right. <laughs> 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 so take heed, grasshopper, <laughs> um, and no disrespect intended by that. Um, you know, we've got bigger problems to solve, frankly, than, I mean, if we've got a water tower that could potentially last another 20 years, we've got a city garage that we're finishing. Mm -hmm. We have got two more stormwater detention basins that or retention basins mm -hmm. um, that have to be built in the next capital improvements year. Um, we are in such desperate situation from a financial standpoint that only four streets are going to be repaired or reconstructed. And now we're talking about spending this kind of money. I don't care that it's been budgeted. As a citizen, I could care less that mm -hmm. the money's been budgeted for. Fix the streets, do some of the other things that really need to be done that have a more pressing urgency on what's going on in the city. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I hear what you're saying, but the city's bond rating was recently lowered, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. it's going to cost us more to borrow money. Our streets look like crap. <laughs> and I don't care where you go. They look like crap. Mm -hmm. And we can only do four? I think that's ridiculous. And, um, you know, the other thing that's going to be coming up here is the governor wants to do away with insurance that, cover, that covers the cities. Well, that money is going to come out of the city's pocket. And I, for one, am getting sick and tired of seeing my taxes going up constantly. So mm -hmm. let's take care of what needs fixing right now. And I, I think, you I th know? no, I think that's a perfectly valid opinion. And, I'm, and there's many community members who I think share your opinion. Um, but the reason why um, I would say do the water tower now is, is the public safety standpoint. I don't know, um, you know, it could have last 20 years. You know, hopefully it does, but we don't know what the city's fiscal um, ability is going to be in 20 years. And if we get 10, 15, 20 years down the road and we have to replace this and we're not fiscally ready to do that, we're going to have a serious public safety problem on our hand. Are we unsafe right now? What was that? Are we unsafe right now? I don't think we're unsafe right now, but, um, you know, it, the estimated 20 years for the water tower is an estimation. 
and we need to provide that public safety. And I think if we do it now, we can make sure we provide that aspect of public safety for the next 80 to 100 years, which is why I would say we should move forward with the project now. Um, so what do you propose cutting then? Because there's not enough money to go around. My, my pockets are empty. They're tapped out. What about yours, Tony? Uh, not doing great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, and you're a young guy just starting out, <laughs> you know, and you're going to very quickly see when you buy a home or whatever um, that it, it's tough out there. You know, every December you just cringe waiting for that <laughs> mailman to come with your property tax bill. <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. It is. It is I, true. I hate it. And, you know, so if, if you want to fix that now, because I, I don't think... It's just my opinion. I don't think the public safety issue is as critical as it may be suggested. I, I mean, mm -hmm. we're safe right now. I don't think our population is going to grow that much, that we're going to need this massive water tower, you know, and maybe there's other particulars involved here. But if you want to do that now, then what else are you going to cut? There's got to be a trade-off financially someplace. So what do you want to cut or what positions do you want to cut? Well, um, what I gathered from the report was that the city has already budgeted the money um, at this point in time. So I don't think we'd see that there'd be like an immediate cut right now for this project. Um, but certainly if, if I was on the, or when I am on the council, if, if you know, the city manager or someone comes and says, hey, you know what, I do think these issues are more pressing or, um, you know, the, we see more input from the community that we want, the, or, you know, that mm -hmm. they do believe that other issues are more pressing. I'm certainly open to... Um, going that way as well, you know, the Marion Water Tower is still in its first couple meetings, and I guess I'd like to see more um, more public input before right. I finally say one way or the other. But that's where I guess right. my feeling is on it. Yeah, right Cheryl's now. talking about streets, and a lot of people in the community are concerned about the way we assess for street repair. I mm -hmm. mean, yeah. private homeowners get really socked on it. Mm -hmm. A lot of low-income people. So Appleton had the same issue, um, and they went. They actually listened to their population. Mm -hmm. And they created a wheel tax, mm -hmm. which is going to completely remove the private assessment for the roads. And it's going to essentially tack on, I think, another 10 or 15 bucks to your, uh, your annual registration. The local city council here doesn't seem to be open to that. Are you, are you open to a discussion of that? I'm certainly open to a discussion. Um, and I'm not too familiar with the Appleton, or with, with that model. But I'm certainly open to... Um, to, to any way it's going to make repairing our streets more affordable. But I think when we, when we do make these assessments, the, right. biggest, the most important thing we do is consistency and fairness across the board. And um, if, that, if that is a, a model that we look right. at and say it's going to be more consistent and fair, then most right. certainly. But we have people coming before the city council in tears mm -hmm. talking yeah. about how their assessment, which, you know, you have years to pay it. Yeah. But when you see the number on the bill, for some people it was like literally a half of their annual income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think they were um, concerned about the fact that the city just didn't seem to show any sympathy toward that. Mm -hmm. Whereas 20 miles up the road, all right, they said, let's do something about this. Yeah. Let's do something creative about it. Mm -hmm. Does anyone like paying an additional tax? I know I wouldn't. But on the other hand, uh, when you see that five, six, seven, eight, nine, some people paying ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 assessment, yeah. all of a sudden that 15 bucks on your registration might not look that, that bad. So... Is it something that you'll research a little bit more? Absolutely, and um, that's definitely something I've heard from uh, citizens in the community when I've been right. talking with people is that that type of assessment. So the need for another model uh, is definitely yeah. there, yeah. And, uh, but consistency and fairness needs to be our number one priority. What about the Pioneer Inn? That's been now a <laughs> mm -hmm. blight for a long time. <laughs> absolutely. Everybody runs for city council saying we've got to do something about the Pioneer Inn, and then every election cycle the same question is asked. What do you think needs to happen over there? Well, the city council is kind of in a tough position because it is privately owned. So their hands are tied and they have limited options. Um, with that said, um, we need to get creative because something needs to happen. Um, when, when I've been talking with residents, everyone says, oh, the Pioneer, or, you know, Pioneer Inn, Pioneer Hall, it used to be fantastic. Yeah, it and, yeah, it was. And uh, I remember going to this there and mm -hmm. this event there. So I would support any measure that can return it to its former glory. Um, but to do so, we need to get creative and we need to think outside the box. Um, we have limited options, but it's, uh, it's, 
time to turn put, put your thinking to caps the on. Owners, because you're right, mm -hmm. the city's hands yeah. are tied. All all the city can do at this point is assess them fines for not mowing the lawn or graffiti on the building or whatever. And you were on the council, right. you know, you dealt with this. Right. Um, I, I well, want to go could, back. We could go down the eminent domain road. That that's I one mean, possibility. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to see that discussed a little bit more, just to yeah. see what it would entail. But yeah, right. I want to go back. <laughs> All right. By all I, means. I, I can't let this go. I'm sorry, Ben. Okay, so the water tower has been the water tower. Right? Yeah. Well, it, it's about money <laughs> yeah. in general, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the water tower has been budgeted for, but what hasn't been budgeted for are all these little things that Governor Walker is doing to whittle away at our budget. Those things haven't been budgeted for. Mm -hmm. So, again, I would ask, what do you, either personnel or programs, you know, what do you see as being on the chopping block? Because something has to go. I mean, clearly. Well, I can't, I guess I can't really talk about specifics until we see what exactly um, we're, we're looking like for our next budget. Um, from what I've gathered from the state budget so far, shared revenues doesn't look like it's going to take uh, too much of a hit. Mm -hmm. So I think the municipality is still going to have, you know, a decent, uh, decent shared revenue from the state. But um, I guess as far as specifics go, I can't, I can't necessarily like start naming things until we see what exactly our cut looks like and in what areas. That's fair. Certain. That's fair. <laughs> now I'll let it go. But, but I hope you understand that something is going to have to change. Something's going to have to be cut someplace because we just can't keep affording all this stuff. Um, I asked the school board candidate this, and um, I'll ask you as well, because it applies to all levels of, in all kinds of government. Um, you know, the city is becoming very diverse as far as its population goes. And um, what, at the same time, though, what doesn't seem to be changing is diversity within uh, the public sector employment base. And um, the one person who has done something about this is Police Chief Scott Groyle. He has taken initiatives to start putting more uh, diversity in their hiring practices, and they've already hired one or two people, I think, who are of a minority. Um, but the city, um, you know, they have... City Manager Mark Roloff passed the buck on to um, retiring uh, Burke Tower, and he kind of just poo-pooed the whole thing. Do you see this as a problem? And if so, do you, what do you think the city needs to do? And would you be that person to propose doing something to increase our diversity hiring? Absolutely. Um, I'd be willing to look at you know something that can improve diversity hiring. Um, I do think diversity is important. I, I do like, um, and I think this is a, another good opportunity where maybe campus and the city can work together because campus um, does so much about promoting diversity and, and re really celebrating diversity. So I think this is an issue where we can work together and you know, bridge that gap I was earlier talking about. But I would be happy to propose something. I would you know, love to uh, sit down with other council members and maybe look at some type of a model to increase diversity. Are you a junior right now? at campus? I'm a second semester sophomore. Okay, so you probably won't graduate before your term is up. Because my question yeah. was going to be, if, if you were to graduate before your term is up, will you, are you going to commit to finishing your two-year term? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I will finish my two-year term. Okay. So. Okay. okay. Um, the city recently held a workshop with, um, you know, the city attorney and the police chief and, and all the counselors on establishing or considering establishing a residency ordinance for sex offenders. Um, it really hasn't gone anywhere yet, but it was made very clear that it is something that will more than likely be brought back in the future. Um, it, and, you know, there are different ways that that could be structured, but in essence, it would restrict where sex offenders can live within the community or if they can live in the community at all. What is Ben Stepanek's view on such an ordinance? I do think in an ordinance, um, I'm, I'm definitely not opposed to an ordinance like that. Um, again, I think it comes back to public safety. Um, I know there's, there's already um, like state statutes about living within certain proximities mm -hmm. of schools and, and things like that. And if there's, um, you know, Area or parks and areas like that where we would we, where we want to keep uh, children safe and we want to keep our community safe and I'm certainly not opposed 
to making sure that um, there's a safe environment in Oshkosh. I'm not opposed to, to something like that to ensure that safety. Cities that have established such ordinances and law enforcement officers, including our own police chief, have said they don't work. They simply flat out do not work. Would you still be of the same opinion then, or would you, you know, hear, hear the advice <laughs> that people older and wiser than you and who are in that particular field are saying? Oh, I'd be, I, I, I want a discussion of this. I want to hear uh, more input. Yeah. I want to hear more input mm -hmm. from our public safety yeah. office before I can, like, really say either way. Okay. But right. um, not necessarily well, polls, but in the Middle involved. Village neighborhood, which I live in, mm -hmm. uh, which we're going to invite you to take a walk through the neighborhood with us. We've been trying to get the city to do two things as regards to this. A, spread it out, mm -hmm. right? Why, why should a disproportionate amount of offenders be in one part of the city, right? That's one mm -hmm. thing. Um, and number two, what's the effect on property values? That's really what we want to mm -hmm. know. I mean, mm -hmm. Cheryl, you know, as a yeah. homeowner, when you're trying to sell your home, a lot of factors come into play. So I, I haven't heard anyone in the neighborhood or in, even in the city who's asking for the kind of ordinance that Cheryl was talking about, right? We've been asking for the city to make good on its claim that this is an at-large city. Every part of the city gets treated equally. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly it doesn't. <laughs> right. Well, you know why they're congregating for the most part with, with these sex offenders in the central city is because that is where a lot of the more inexpensive housing is. So we have to look at that. We have to start getting some more affordable housing in other places in the city. We're, we probably need another hour just for this, uh, I'm sure <laughs> we do. For this yeah. issue. I'm sure we do. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, what about transparency in local government? I mean, do you think Oshkosh citizens should be confident that we have enough sense of what's going on in City Hall? I mean, what, how do you plan to promote transparency as a council member? Well, I can tell you, um, personally, I've been a little bit frustrated. I think it's more of okay. just where I don't know where to go necessarily to find the transparency. Um, I'm someone who, you know, a political nerd, you know, up top, mm -hmm. I want to, you know, um, so for me, reading the paper isn't enough and going online and getting minutes and things like right. that. But, um, but I would like to see the city council maybe be a little more transparent. Um, it seems like they already have um, a good idea of how, they're, how the meeting is going to run before they, they show up and vote. So I think it would be good if there were more transparency into or if, if the discussion took place at the meeting rather before the meeting. Right. I think it would be better if that discussion took place and we can have... Uh, and the public can see that discussion develop. Oh, do you think that there are counselors that are already, like, before the meetings, dis discussing among each other what to do? Well, I think that there's a... Uh, I want to just say that they, they, they go into the meeting, like, already decided, but right. I think there's kind of a general consensus where, where everybody stands and they kind of uh, have an idea as to, as to where they're going to fall on an issue before they go in. Um, I'm, as far so as... You say, so you're saying you might be someone who you'll go into a meeting, you might have a general sense of where you're headed on a, on a resolution, let's say, mm -hmm. but the citizen comment and the council discussion could sway you at that moment. Certainly. I think... Because I, think I, I haven't sensed that with all mm -hmm. elected officials. Mm -hmm. I, ju I think that there's just... I just think that there's not enough discussion about issues being taken place mm -hmm. at the council. I think we show up, or they show up, they ask a couple questions, and then that's, that's kind of... Kind of council, and I would like to see the the nitty gritties of of a resolution discussed in front of the public. I mean, when I was on the council, Cheryl, will remember we got criticized for keeping the meetings going on too long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you do ask a lot of questions, keep the meeting going. That's no good. Mm -hmm. But then if the meeting is too short and you get it done, <laughs> that's not good either. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's got to be a, mi a middle ground, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with that, uh, I was just told we're we're at uh, almost uh, zero minutes right. here. Why don't you just take about 20 seconds or so, look into camera three, tell folks why they should vote for you, Ben. Well, I'm someone who's going to be uh, extremely dedicated and hardworking. Um, I've had a unique opportunity where I've had this, I've I've had the opportunity to spend more time preparing to be on council rather than running for it. And I think I can be a very effective city councilor, and I hope to have your vote. All right, very good. Thank you so much, and that is going to do it for us. Just sit tight for a second. Mm -hmm. Tony, thanks. Thank thanks you. to our guests Thank this you. evening, and thanks to the crew, and most of all, thanks to all of you. We'll see you next time when we'll be interviewing more candidates, uh, those two for the Oshkosh School Board. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh. Mm -hmm.